My name is Dr. Lori Barge from the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And uh, are we alone in the universe? I don't know. <laughs> we don't know. No, we don't know, and that's part of what we're so interested in exploring other worlds for, is to find out. And what, how are you going to find out? Well, we're looking for signs of life on other planets, either microbial or otherwise, and defining what those signs are is one of the hardest challenges. When I asked you, are we alone, what did you understand by the word we? I think you meant we, all life on Earth. Oh. That's what I would assume. Oh. So we're mostly interested in, is there life on other planets? I see. Now, a lot of people I talk to don't care about microbes. They're looking for mm -hmm. sentient beings. Oh. And uh, do you, are, you're not looking for sentient beings? I mean, that would be interesting as well, but I think we all should be interested in microbes because microbes were the first life on Earth. And so if life emerged somewhere else in a similar fashion, then maybe it would be the first life there too. And for a long time, Earth was mostly microbes. So it's important to consider, you know, when you're looking at the history of a planet, Microbes could be the most dominant form and the most likely to, to find. When you say microbes, can you be a little bit more specific? Are you talking about, uh, let's see, archaea or bacteria or viruses or virons or hypercycles or what? Well, it depends. For Earth, it was uh, archaea and bacteria for a long time. And so on another world, we don't know. It just depends how life began. So I guess looking at Earth, we can see that the, the tree of life has these three branches. And at their root, there was something that eventually evolved into all of these. So in another world, who knows? If I gave you $100 billion with the caveat you had to spend it to try to answer the question, are we alone, how would you spend it? Well, I guess I would send a lot of missions. And I would also fund a lot of origin of life research in the lab. Would you uh, invest in microscopes to look for nano aliens in like little spaceships from advanced civilizations? Probably not. Because? I think that I would, I would focus on looking for microbes because even though we have intelligent life on Earth, we also still have microbes. So it's a good bet that if you have life, you have microbes because that's how it started. So. Right, but it's probably a good bet that if you're looking for alien civilizations that might have explored the galaxy, that you wouldn't be looking for microbes, you, of the microbes from another planet. You'd be looking for little spaceships that have made all the way all the way here. I think what, if it was me personally, because I don't study that, I don't really have enough expertise to design a mission that would detect that particular thing. But somebody else may. Do you think we're living inside of an alien? <laughs> no. No. You think dark matter or dark energy has anything to do with uh, life in the universe? Uh, probably. If it's, if it's a part of the universe, then it most likely affects all the physical conditions that then lead to life and planetary formation. I mean, it couldn't be like vacuum fluctuations be some type of life form. I mean, who knows? <laughs> These are all hypothetical <laughs> things we, we don't really know. You're not investigating those particular aspects <laughs> no, of the search no. for life. Okay, what part of your research uh, is most relevant to answering the question, are we alone? Well, I study the uh, planetary environments in the solar system mostly. So things like Mars, Europa, Enceladus, the ones that we are going to visit in my lifetime, I hope. And so this will be um, looking at the soils and the ices and the oceans and what sort of chemistry can happen within. So I look at origin of life, prebiotic chemistry, but also how life can live there once it's established. Some people who are looking at the origin of life are convinced, like Christian Dudu, who thinks life is a cosmic imperative. And they are, therefore, when I ask them, are we alone, they say, no, we're not alone because of their strongly held convictions that, well, first of all, there are lots of Earth-like planets, and that's almost uncontroversial now, but all, that once you have wet, rocky planet, then you will have life. But you don't agree with that. Um, I don't know that I have an opinion on it either way because we have so little data about how life really started on Earth and we don't have any other examples yet. So for now I have to kind of stay agnostic because I just don't know. Are you looking for shadow life? Because some of us have written papers about how there might be life on Earth that we don't know about. Well, if we don't know about it, then it would be hard to look for it. So even designing, designing a mission to detect life as we know it, even life that we understand really well, is still very difficult. So I think yeah. it would be pretty hard to design one for life that we don't know much about. Is the question, are we alone, an important question? Uh, it is to me. How about for the rest of the humanity? I think you should have to ask them. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't asked them? I mean, Don't depends. you talk to people? <laughs> Some <laughs> or, people are Don't you ever get out? <laughs> Everyone has their own, their own things they're interested in. So I, I think it's important. So you think, what, what makes you think it's important? 
because I'm curious about why we're here in general. And so part of that is how did we get here? Like what is the origin of life? What, how did you know, the earth and the sun get here and all this? But also then why are we here is also why, are, why is life not other places? So why isn't it everywhere? Why isn't it obviously everywhere in the solar system? And that's part of you know, the relevance of why it is here on Earth. Well, you, you said life several times as if you know what you're talking about. Now, do you know what life is? It's are, not. It's are viruses not. alive, for example? Prions alive, fires alive, volcanoes alive, galaxies alive? How do you do So the de definition of life is one of these things where people disagree on it, and it's, it's pretty hard to define. So when I say life, I, I realize there's a spectrum of non-life to life, and so Earth has life, and so I'm interested in how that got here. But there's a lot of things where it is kind of a gray area. So those things exist too, and life is a spectrum. All right, but when you're trying to look for life elsewhere, if you find gray stuff, then you're going to say, well, maybe I found life, maybe I haven't? Yeah, it could happen. This is one of the things about biosignatures, is when you're defining a biosignature, you can say that life has XYZ trait, but maybe another abiotic process has it too. And so you may find something, but it may not be unique to life. So that's another thing that we have to consider. Well, how, you said abiotic and biotic. How about semi-abiotic? Sure. You're happy with that? I mean, we don't know. So you might, you might find a signature that life has, but you don't know if non-life or something else also has. So if it's not unique, then it may not actually be a life detection. Now, yesterday you gave a talk, and I was surprised because you've been working on the uh, hydrothermal vent simulations, and I think you said that you don't think hydrothermal vents are, is a good place to, for the origin of life. And I thought that was one of the things that you were thinking of. Um, I think in that question, someone asked me if black smokers at mid-ocean ridges were. So that's a different thing. Okay, so where do you think, do you have any, what are your best ideas about narrowing down the constraints on the, the site for the origin of life on Earth? Well, I actually don't think that it's productive to, to, to try to predict which specific environment it happened in because it's more important as a chemist to look at the conditions for a reaction. So when we're looking at reactions in the lab, we may find that a certain condition promotes a certain reaction, and this is good. But then we often will jump to conclusions about which environments have that condition and which ones don't. And that's the sort of thing where we are often surprised in geology about which environments have certain conditions, especially when you consider exploring other planets. So it's best to be to say which conditions you would like to find, and then when you explore the solar system, be open to any environment that can provide that for you. Have you seen the movie Contact? Yes. And in that movie, several times, somebody asks somebody else, are we alone? And the answer is, well, if we are, it's an awful waste of space. What do you think of that response? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I mean, if there's life on planets, I guess most of the space will not have life. <laughs> but if there's not, is it a waste of space? No, the whole point is that, you know, if, if we're not there, or if the, our kind of life is not there, then it's a waste. Oh, I don't think so. Well, that's what the, that was what's oh. implied, right? No, I don't think it's a waste. I mean, there's, I'm, well, it depends on what you're interested in, but I'm interested in, you know, the, the physics of reality and all the things that are out there in nature. And so I personally find value in learning about other planets, even when we're not looking for life. So I know that some people are mostly focused on life detection, mm -hmm. but I, I would support also missions where you're just learning about, say, how planets form, or the geology, or the physics of them, and I'm interested in all of that. Now, when I gave you $100 billion, you didn't mention anything about SETI. No, that's not really what I do, but that's right, valuable but, too. Well, I'm going to give you $100 billion, you could do a lot more than just what you do, right? Yeah, but I think you can't do everything, <laughs> so it would, it, would, it would be kind of on I think others who are more expert in those areas to decide how best to spend. Well, would you own. hire them to help you, or would you just say, hey, I'm going to do what I do? I don't know. <laughs> okay, do you have a favorite solution to Fermi's paradox? Not really. No, I don't think we have a solution to that. No. You don't want to guess? Spec can you speculate a little bit? Um, I don't know where this one's going. <laughs> Well, for example, maybe life doesn't get started elsewhere, and there's no, we're the only life in the universe, and that's, that's the solution. Or maybe technological life doesn't evolve, even if it's left to life, it's not technological life. And, or maybe when you get technological life, you kill yourself, or a whole bunch, of, or maybe they are keeping us in the zoo, or, you know, there's a whole bunch. <laughs> you don't have any favorites there, huh? I mean, these are all very hypothetical scenarios. So they are indeed. It's pretty hard to know which, you know, there's no evidence for one way or the other, so I can't really say. 
Well, there seems to be evidence that we <laughs> haven't detected aliens. That Where we, we would, haven't detected anything. Yeah, you would agree that that's evidence. No, I mean, I don't think that's scientific. If it's, you haven't detected something, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Right, right, right. But unless you've looked a lot. I mean, you could look a lot. We, we have detected many things in science that were undetected for a long time before that. Doesn't yes. mean they didn't exist. Um, now I'm going to ask you an emotional question. Okay. And that is, you have to close your eyes, take a deep breath. <laughs> and the question is, what kind of aliens would you like to find? Oh, well, I guess... <laughs> to be honest, I'd be excited about any of them. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm nerdy about these things, so I would be pretty excited about bacteria and archaea <laughs> because I am a geobiologist. I did, so. But I didn't ask you what would be excited. I guess what kind would you like to find? I guess that's a kind of like I want to be excited, right? So, oh. Um, um, well, I mean, I would be delighted to find microbes in another world. Well, a lot of people want to find smart aliens who can help us solve our problems, for example. You know, yeah. like, like God-like aliens who can say, oh, you should do this and give us advice and then lead us through the bottleneck mm -hmm. towards non-self-destruction so we can live forever or something. Oh, I mean, I don't really, I'm not, I don't think that that is going to be as interesting, I guess. It's not something that I think about that much. Okay. And you've talked to students and the public about these issues about looking for life elsewhere. Uh, what do you think the public's biggest misconceptions are about this issue of Are We Alone? Um, hmm. Let's see. What is our biggest misconception? Well, I have to think about that. Ask me that in like in a couple okay, questions. Okay, in about a minute. Okay, yeah. next question. Do you have any advice for students who are thinking about becoming astrobiologists? Oh, well, I would say to do well in school, of course, major in a science field. You don't have to major in astrobiology itself, but you can major in one of the fields related, like astronomy, biology, chemistry. And in, it, there's a really thriving early career community in astrobiology or all around the world. And so it is possible to participate in this no matter what your major is. And that's how I got into this field is easy, even as an astronomy or a geology student, I was able to interact with all these astrobiologists internationally. So that is, that is really what got my career started. So I'd recommend that people go to events and email researchers and contact people and just become part of the community and participate. And you never know what opportunities could emerge. Okay, back to the previous question. Uh, biggest misconceptions? Um, I think one of the ones that I encounter a lot is people don't really understand the diversity of life on Earth. And so when we're talking about, okay, we're looking for life on Mars or somewhere else, they, they don't really think about all the ways that life could exist there. So there are ways that life lives on Earth, like chemosynthesis and different metabolisms and stuff like this. And they don't really appreciate the full diversity of what could be possible on Earth, therefore on other planets. And so that can make it hard to explain why we design instruments the way we do. You made a statement yesterday in your talk that uh, you said that there are organisms on Earth who could live on Mars. Mm -hmm. And you, you said specifically a type of organism. Um, so there's, there's various types. I don't know this for sure because we haven't done it. And I don't actually grow bacteria in but my But haven't lab, they been grown so. in Mars simulated environments on Earth? I do not, I'm not familiar enough with that literature to say this on, on okay. record, okay. but I can give some papers. Okay. But I would imagine that because Mars is a large place with a lot of subsurface area, there's probably a condition where you could grow something. Okay. So you would need to find a bacteria that utilizes electron donors and acceptors that would be found there and then can grow under those physiological conditions. Okay. You think we're making progress in this uh, origin of life field? I think so. Trying to understand how life got started on Earth? Yeah, a lot has been done. Could you give us one or two examples about the progress? Well, I mean, in general, or like with what I in general, in general, over the last twenty years, for example, has it been what progress has been made in trying to understand the origin of life on Earth? Oh goodness, that's a big one. Let me think about this. Well, I guess in general, a lot of say mineral organic reactions have been studied, and so Amino mineral, or mineral organic reactions. So mineral organic reactions have been studied, and we have. I mean, this is also before twenty years ago, but understanding how the geological environment affects organic chemistry, but also origin of life chemistry, and also life itself. So just environmental influences on things have been studied a lot, and that's often, helped out. Often the question comes up: Well, if that's how life got started, how come it's not? It's getting started now at the same environment. What's your answer to that? Well, it depends on how it got started. But so one one usual answer is that early Earth was very different than modern Earth. Mm -hmm. So if it required some condition that was 
special to early Earth, so it's something like no oxygen in the atmosphere, then it wouldn't really be feasible for it to happen now. Or heavy bombardment. Or something, or something like that. Or it could be that if you're, if you're having prebiotic chemistry now, then you produce organics, but they just get eaten because there's already life. <laughs> so it may not be possible to have a prebiotic world on a world where life already is, just because those chemicals won't be allowed to persist. So either, either way. 